Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Out and About on the Think Tech Alive streaming network series. I'm your host, Winston Welch, and delighted you are joining us today, where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and not connected with any organization I might be affiliated with. That said, joining me today in the studio, I am delighted to have Ryan Mesa, K-8 principal of Asset School, and Mari Kim, parent of a student there. Actually, uh, multiple uh, students there, depending on if it's summer or mm -hmm. not. So with that, I would like to welcome you both to the show today. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having Pleasure. us. Uh, so tell us, what is Asset School? I think that most people have, are, are not uh, aware that this, that this institution exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are a K-12 independent school. Um, and we have a really unique mission within the independent school community. So we um, are there to serve really bright kids who often have something that is uh, some kind of learning difference. So you know, really bright but struggle with reading or writing or math or spelling. Sometimes they have a hard time sustaining attention. Um, they mm -hmm. could be gifted. It could be any number of those things I said combined. And so these have really unique profiles and often struggle in very traditional settings. So we do things in a in often very non-traditional ways. In very non-traditional ways. So uh, the the specialty is on gifted and is it dyslexic or is it just lear just some some kinds of learning difficulties? Yeah, good question. So we definitely have a, a lot of kids who are gifted or, or who are just bright, maybe not gifted, not identified as gifted as a unique profile, but certainly bright and capable. And then. Um, yes, more than just dyslexia, things like dysgraphia, which would be struggle mm -hmm. with writing, or dyscalculia, which is struggle with math. But, mm -hmm. but reading is the number one learning dif difference. So because of that, we have more kids with reading needs than those other needs, just because in the general population, that's how it plays out. And is that, that's the term of dyslexia? Dyslexia. OK. Yeah. And discal dis dyscalculia? Dyscalculia. Would be mad. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to say they have that. Which brings us to a point that, that I think we, we use these terms dyslexia and gifted rather loosely in our society. So um, I don't know, Mari, can you tell us a, about uh, your experience? If, if, if yes. uh, you had, said, uh, had told me that you um, actually so, were diagnosed dyslexic, or maybe you diagnosed yourself, or how did, how yes, did you get so that? so as a very young child, I was referred, as they say, because I seemed to be problematic in school. I seemed to have some kind of learning difficulty, although despite being relatively bright. So at that time, the ways of testing were such that they labeled you as just a sort of special, chi special education needs child which is a really broad term. And I now, having had four out of five children diagnosed as dyslexi, dyslexic, three of which also have dysgraphia, um, I, I, I can see the parallels oh. to myself. And at that time, when you were a student, were you yeah. placed in the special ed class? I, was, um, I wasn't placed, but I was placed in um, speech pathology. I, was, I, I think there was a earnest um, effort to try to figure out what, what is with this child. Mm -hmm. Does she need a speech therapist? Right. Does she need some kind of other occupational therapy? Mm -hmm. um, so it, there was a, a kind of lack of understanding. Like, mm -hmm. you, you, our children are so lucky today. There's a greater legibility of what the need is. So basically, back when, back in the day, we'll back just in say the day. they yes. they didn't have standard tests that would do this. And no. for kids these days, are there tests that they get right when they come to kindergarten, like across the board? Yeah. Wow, well, that would be fantastic. I yeah. mean, I think it obviously varies school to school, district to district. Yeah. I mean, that would be amazing. And some states and districts are moving towards that, where all kindergartners are being screened um, and kind yeah. of being red flagged for for you know either having some kind of learning difference or at the very least being sort of at risk because sometimes it's, it can be difficult that young. Um, but I would say we're really far from that, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and can I add of course. that also having had so many dyslexic children and being very vocal about advocating, um, so many parents have come when their child is four or five to me and say, my child is also dyslexic. They're reversing their letters. And I always have to say, um, there are things that are just normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dyslexic children, it certainly appears differently and uniquely. 
And are th uh, when you say reversing their letters, are they seeing the C backwards? So the brain is just not switching yeah, it. It can't differentiate a B and a D. It, it is unable to differentiate which way it should face every time. That, so in the same sentence, a dyslexic child will write the B one way, and three words later, it will flip this way, and two words later, it'll flip this way again. Okay, so, and parents might, as some part of that might be normal. When they're young, when children are four, five, six, they may just go, oh, my child's dyslexic. Right, so, <laughs> so yeah, what I is saying is really important because one of the big yeah. misconceptions is that dyslexia is something with the visual system, mm -hmm. yes. and it's not. It's not. It's, it's not, it's about language. But what, what, she's, what Mary is saying is really important because most early readers are going to do letter reversals, mm -hmm. and that's actually really common. Very. Except that, you know, oftentimes folks with dyslexia, that will persist. Um, and it's not the defining characteristic, but it does persist. Um, and most mm -hmm. other kids will outgrow. But it's not, you know, at that early stage, um, an automatic by any means. No. So you, your K through, your, your school's K through 8, and then there's the high school, which is, I guess, 9 through 12. Right. Uh, <laughs> I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, how do parents figure this out, like right from K or one or two, and they're coming to you, or do you see like large numbers of increase by the time they get to second, third, and fourth grade? That's exactly right. So we're trying really hard to sort of change that trend. But what I would say is the more um, mm -hmm. common projection is that we're not identifying kids early for a variety of reasons. Either the schools aren't helping. Um, parents aren't willing to accept that yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All kinds of really legitimate reasons mm -hmm. why that's not happening. And then as kids get older, certainly these conditions aren't going away. They're actually, you know, kind of being exaggerated because mm -hmm. demands are increasing, their skills are lagging. And so we see uh, an increase around third and fourth grade. We'll see an increase around middle school. So, you know, we will continue to see our inquiries and enrollment go up just because the demands are now exceeding the skills. And I can imagine that a lot of kids that, that, that are dyslexic or have uh, these other learning uh, mm -hmm. differences, they're not diagnosed properly, so they, they get labeled in a certain way or they go to the special resource room for between one and three or whatever it right. might be in the public schools, and they, they, they might get shuffled along, and then that might contribute to some social or um, behavioral issues yeah. then, be, like feeling like I'm not, I'm not the same as the other kids, and what you know, what's wrong, or so you have maybe some other things on top of that too. Yeah. And on top of just school being hard for every child, <laughs> you know, or if yeah. it isn't, you know, I think most kids feel like uh, yeah. they, they don't want to be different. Or, yeah. And you know what Ryan is saying is really important. Often, I'm very vocal in telling other parents that my child is dyslexic. Mm -hmm. My child will probably consistently have very low marks in a more traditional school system. And I've actually had parents react to me as if I've just said, my child has a terminal disease. They go, I'm so sorry, what can I do to help? And I have to remind them, it's such a gift. Mm -hmm. It's such a life gift, but the perception when you're not exposed to it is one of fear and anxiety. Yeah. So the fact that parents sometimes take longer to be able to come to terms with it is not always the best thing for the child. And so the earlier the diagnosis, the better. Absolutely. I mean, I think we would always want to get intervention as early as possible, yes. you know, in terms yeah. of helping kids to learn to read. But also what you were saying earlier is so important. Kids are really, really bright. They're intuitive. They're smart. When, yeah. when something is off, they know something is off. And so when the adults in their life don't help them understand who they are as a learner, they start to draw really inaccurate and inappropriate conclusions yeah. about themselves, like mm -hmm. they're not smart, like mm -hmm. they're not capable, which mm -hmm. is just not true, but it's a very logical conclusion to draw. Sure. And so, you yeah. know, if we're not seeing somebody till, let's say, fifth or sixth grade, now we're also unpacking five and six years of school failure, school right. struggle, yeah. identity issues. Yeah. Just because, again, it's, it's, it, it makes sense that that would be confusing and frustrating mm -hmm. and aggravating. Well, and, and you said, so four out of five of your kids have been diagnosed, you were diagnosed, so it is a genetic. Genetic. Is it possible that it's not genetic, or uh, it's always genetic? Can you answer that yeah, you right, um, It's highly heritable. So, mm -hmm. so it, you know, if, um, by no means is it a guarantee, if yes. your parents have it, that, that you'll have it, but your odds go way up. Okay. So, yeah. 
where the best numbers we can give around that is, a, even though it's a big range, like right. 30 to 60 percent prevalence rate, which means that if your parents have it, you have a 30 to 60 percent chance. Okay. Certainly, yeah. we have kids at the school whose parents are not dyslexic, <laughs> but sort of the, the kind of yeah. the, um, tongue in cheek way of saying it is that apples fall from apple trees. So, so oftentimes, um, you know, yeah. what a child is struggling with is often a parent's experience as well. Okay, so uh, maybe you have a little yeah. more empathy for your kids, hopefully, because of yeah. what you went through. And Absolutely. then you, did you get yours tested at a young age? Or? About 10 or 11, and yeah. after some frustration. And, and of course, the testing was not, the testing as we know today, it was non-specific. Mm -hmm. It was just that this child, it's what, and Ryan can explain this better, is a twice exceptional child. Why is this child so smart, but why is this child so, un so unable to do basic things that it does, it did, at the time when I was young, it didn't make sense, so you get labeled as a special needs child. Well, and, 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 it's, and it's interesting because as we get more involved in genetic testing, I'm sure they'll exactly be able to yeah. highlight and say in advance, okay, just to be aware, this may or may not be a condition that comes up in the future, but right now it's it's something where you sit down with the, an evaluator and yeah. she or he goes through some tests with the kids. Now you mentioned the double gifted or the, the gifted part of your yeah. school, which is another, mm -hmm. it's very interesting for me that ASSETS focuses on that as well because yeah. uh, our gifts are all unique and, and, and special and kids don't I would say typically don't receive any special attention to develop those gifts in the traditional public schools, That's, although yeah. I would like to say that they teachers do the best they can with yeah. what they have, but they're overwhelmed with, mm -hmm. with having too many kids in the class and not enough time and a lot of uh, difficult responsibilities. Tell us about the gifted part of the, of the school. Yeah, so the school has had this really wonderful legacy of serving both gifted kids and kids with learning differences, and like Myri is saying, kids who are both, you know, mm -hmm. so what we call twice exceptional. So if you were gifted and dyslexic, and that's a unique profile unto itself. And so what's, those, are, those are such neat kids, but I think what I just want to share that's so important to understand about them is that all human beings have these sort of strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. kind of like a jagged profile. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you're a relatively average person, you know, it's not that big a difference. But for these two E kids, these twice exceptional kids, they look like this, you know, intense strengths and significant weaknesses. And mm -hmm. so that experience, I think, again, if the adults aren't helping you and supporting you, yeah. it's very confusing. Why can I do math two levels above my classmates, but I can't read still? You know, mm -hmm. that, so, th you know, um, how we as a school sort of address all of this together is that we just have this long legacy of meeting kids where they are, mm -hmm. growing from there, um, mm -hmm. differentiating instruction, you know, and individualizing it as much as we can. And that allows you to work with kids who are, you know, moving really quickly, kids who are moving really slowly. Um, we also try our best to do a lot around strength-based education. So yes, you know, there are some deficits, and we mm -hmm. need to give those attention, and we're mm -hmm. gonna, you know, hopefully help you improve in those areas, but. You can't focus all of your time and you know only see the kid through what he he or she doesn't do well. You have to give equal attention to what he or she does really well. And how do we help you develop those skills and kind of flex those muscles? Because at the end of the day, typically, um, if you help a kid, you know those strengths really really carry the day. Sort of what they leverage yeah. as they get older and as adults, and they sort of figure out how to compensate for the, the deficits, assuming so we can get them through school in one piece. So. So you know, you you know, focusing on strengths is a is a major part of what we do at Assets. Mm -hmm. Strengths based education. Yeah. That's that's it's Absolutely. really nice. Yeah, yeah, no matter who the student is, if we could focus, find what the strengths are and focus on those. Uh, you know, yeah. of course, mathematics is important, but did I, I don't use a lot of calculus. Or um, you know, at Assets, they actually use a child's strengths to break the code. I always tell my children, it's mm -hmm. like your weaknesses. It's like a code, and you cannot read that code. You have to find, you have to be the code breaker. And once they break their own code, but assets uses a child's strengths to leverage their weaknesses, which is what's so unique about assets. That's a really great. It's uh, incredible. And how yeah. did you find, how did you find the school? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, when my, I have a 12 year old, and when she was little, I actually reached out for the first time because I, having her two other brothers been diagnosed and seeing the same traits in her, I knew she would need specialized education. But at the time, I chose not to. I was a very much a single parent, so I chose, I wasn't able to take her so far from where, where we lived in Kailua, so she actually went to a very traditional private school. Okay. 
Um, I have two seven-year-old twins, one at Assets and one in a traditional private school. And, but one has very specialized needs, and I knew that he would not succeed in any traditional environment. And there was no question that he had to be taught in a way that was so unique to him. And how long has he been there now? Since kindergarten, so he's just completing first grade yeah, almost. Two years. Yeah, okay. two years. And, uh, and actually, my daughters go there during the summers. Okay, so there's a summer program too, in case people maybe yeah. want, think that this might be a place to try out or to or maybe supplementary uh, to what they're getting or something. And uh, we will have to get to that after our break. Um, see, the time moves by really fast. <laughs> There's too much information to, to cover here. But uh, it is my pleasure to uh, have on my show today Ryan Mesa and Mari Kim, a uh, parent of a student. And Ryan is the K-8 uh, principal at Asset School at Winston Welch. And we're going to be back in just a moment on Out and About on Think Tech Hawaii. Who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Hey. Hey, baby. That's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hello, hi, and we are back on Out and About on Think Tech Live Hawaii. I'm Winston Welch, host of the show, and I am delighted this week to have Ryan Mesa, principal K-8 of Asset School, and Mari Kim, a parent of a student or more at Asset <laughs> School. And you said you've got a couple twins, and one of them's going to school there, and the yeah. other one is uh, going to be going this summer? Yes, two more. The, my two daughters will both be joining this summer. Oh, two daughters, and how old is the other one? So um, I have a 12-year-old going this summer, and then the twins are seven. Okay, and is the school program the same in the summer, or is it how, how does it differ? Um, well, it's a shorter day, but mm -hmm. but it's sort of at this at philosophically, you know, it's the same program in that we're going to give you know kids really individualized attention and differentiated instruction and you know evidence-based practices to help with specific skills like reading. So that part of it is is the same. So the teachers that you hire obviously have very specific skills and training background in in working with uh, gifted and uh, learning differences. Uh, kids with learning differences. Uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, yes. I think that, again, sort of, unfortunately, the reality of the field is that most folks aren't coming out of their um, undergrad programs or even their graduate mm -hmm. programs with this toolbox. Mm -hmm. I think it is a really, and I think it sort of explains why so many kids are struggling in other settings. So we do a lot of professional development in-house um, okay. and for the community, but but also for our own faculty to, mm. to get them those tools and those toolbox. So it's still really a kind of an emerging and growing field as we're understanding this more and more and how to okay. how to work with it and how to develop uh, teachers and students. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. as in every field, we're just kind of, I feel like humanity is just on the verge of, yeah. we're just, just starting to, to know what we don't know, you know, in, in, in some levels. Um, so, so tell us, and you, you've got these other kids. They they were dyslexic. Are they are they successful? Yes. And so, my oldest son graduated from medical school a few years ago. Okay. He's finishing his residency. Okay. And um, he struggled. Tears, tears, tears all through school. Struggle, struggle, struggle. And my second son graduated last year, and he joined Morgan Stanley as a young investment banker. So both of them struggled. And neither of them went to actually specialized schools. And so, so most of the kids, the huge majority uh, that have some issue are going through the regular schools. Absolutely. But they're able to figure it out and, and yeah. get along. But it's so much better if they can be, if their needs can be met and they can be yes. 
you know, uh, addressed. Yes, we yeah. are the dyslexia poster family. <laughs> 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 and in, in our family, it's so normal, <laughs> and it's such a gift to be dyslexic. That, that is their standard of normalcy, that the one that hasn't been diagnosed is so upset that he doesn't have a formal diagnosis. <laughs> it's, like, it's, a, it's a gift. It's a gift. To, it's a gift. Oh, it's a gift. It, because it, 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 it's from our differences that we develop as human beings. You I know, think I, I'm a firm believer is. of that. Absolutely. Yeah, and maybe even our struggles or difficulties, that that's sort of where the channels come in and, and makes us deeper people uh, yeah. as well. So obviously, you, uh, now with your, with your sons, did you know that something was up with the, yes. with the older ones? So the older one was the hardest because he's the first, so he had to break ground. Sure. And, um, <laughs> so, um, but he actually went to the London School for Boys. It's a very difficult and tough and you know, very privileged private school in England mm. where the curriculum really was tough for him. Yeah. My second son um, actually went to the London School for Boys. So it's a public school. And we have a joke that um, Christopher learned fencing and Louis learned survival knife skills. <laughs> you know, <laughs> two different. But, you know, and they found their own ways. And I, as a parent, I truly believe if you have a child with a learning difficulty, the best thing you can do for your child is to let them find their way and try not to interfere too much mm -hmm. and try not to impose what you think is going to be best because in that resilience of finding their way, they will build the strength they need to succeed. And so when kids come to you and they might have had, you said, those five or six, seven years of difficulties and maybe then some identity things of where they're saying, oh, I'm this or I'm that, you know, because I, I, I can't do this or I can't do that. Or mm -hmm. um, Tell us what kind of support is there in the school or what type of supportive environment is there? Yeah, I mean, so we, we think of, you know, intervention as being educational, but also environmental. So mm -hmm. it's not one or the other. I mean, if it was only educational, it would be like tutoring. You know, it has to be environmental. And so... Um, we have a lot of um, kind of counseling support, and, and that's just to help. You know, oftentimes these kids don't like school. They don't, it hasn't <laughs> been a good experience. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They don't trust classmates. Sure, yeah. They don't trust teachers. It just. It hasn't been a place where they've thrived. So again, that's a, a mm -hmm. logical conclusion to draw. And so you're really helping them um, regain trust in mm. in learning and education. And mm. you know, learning is is such a vulnerable experience. You have to really take a risk to learn. And so if you're kind of wounded, you know, you, you need help to take that risk again yeah. because That's right. it's, you know, it, it's, it can be scary. And so, um, you know, we talked about sort of the gift of dyslexia, but all these things that we're talking about, you know, that can turn on you. That can, you know, that gift can turn on you. And, yeah. and these kids really are at risk, even though we have a million success stories. If they don't get the right kind of support, we know mm -hmm. that they have higher rates of juvenile detention centers and unwanted teen pregnancies and car accidents and, and substance abuse and all kinds of things so because they all of that. Cutting, they, yeah. they've drawn really inappropriate conclusions about themselves yeah. and what their future could be. Now, are, are you a member of any like parents with dyslexia group or anything like that? No, or? actually, I'm not. Okay. Yeah, it's I've, I've actually reached out a few times, mm -hmm. but I think it's more of a testimony to the lack of uh, time. <laughs> but <laughs> but they're an incredible kids. group. That's, that's yeah. enough. And plus, and, and you and you're gainfully employed yourself and very yeah. busy. So, is there is there what what for parents do you have uh, at the school? Uh, actually, it, it, just now that you brought that up. Yeah, we try yeah. our best to have um, sort of parent forums where people can come together around um, mm. different topics. So this year we ran a, a handful of ones. One was on toys, exceptional kids. Mm. Um, one was on mindsets. One was on. Um, I'm John. I think it was information processing or sensory processing. So just you know, different things in the life of raising a child, particularly one yeah. who, who may learn differently. Okay, so you're teaching the kids about their their kids, or you're teaching the parents about their kids and what they might be learning. Now, what are the courses do you offer besides the regular courses at school, or are mm -hmm. they the regular courses at school, but maybe with some more emphasis on uh, each individual student's interests and, and needs? Um, I mean, we are traditional in that sense that you still have, you know, your sort of basic subjects. Uh, what's unique about us is that we do integrated thematic units so that, you know, what you're learning in homeroom is the same thing that you're learning about in music and drama, so it all sort of, you know, comes together nicely. I think the biggest difference is that we have this really fantastic enrichment program. So even the youngest kids, um, we give them a menu of things to choose from, different mm -hmm. courses like rocketry, 3D printing, coding, 
yoga, glass etching, clock making. We, yeah, I remember all those classes when I was a kid. You, know, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you name all it, those. and we <laughs> offer it, and then yeah. um, kids rank them, and then we run them on 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 like three week cycles. So, so neat. it gives kids mm -hmm. a chance to try something on that they maybe don't know if they like or not, and then you have the kid who knows exactly what he or she loves, mm -hmm. and it lets them just do a deep dive, that's and again, so really flex those muscles and. That's what we mean when we say strength based. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So you got, do you have specialty teach folks coming in and just teaching a, a class for a series? Uh, Occasionally, but more often than not, it's our teachers uh -huh. offering things that, that, that they, they have their skills exactly. on. Yeah. You is, know, for instance, my son is taking knitting. Yes. And he said, Mom, I'm not going to school today. And I said, why? He said, I don't like to knit, Mom. And But, but Philip has dysgraphia. He, the nerves in his hands are damaged, okay. and knitting is a really fun. He's come around. He's come <laughs> around now, but at yeah. first he thought this knitting thing, mom, is really hard. So, but the, it's such an amazing way to teach a child how to use is, their fine motor skills. That is so interesting. Yeah. And who would have thought something like that? You know, a while I ago. know. And in a very different way than the pen, a pencil to paper. So absolutely. I, now the school, I, I, I was reading on, on your on your website, which is assets dash school dot net assets dash school dot net, dot net yeah. okay or the assets yeah. hyphen school dot net Correct. and it said it, it started a long time ago on the military base and then I know you you had a, um, a sort of a, a, a Acquisition or, or merger with Academy of the Pacific up on in is it Aleva Heights? Yeah, a beautiful new campus up there. So now you have two campuses, and uh, mm -hmm. tell us what growth is going on there um, mm -hmm. at, at the oh at either at both schools, I guess. Yeah, it's super exciting for the mm -hmm. school and its history. So we have the two campuses now within the last five years. The high school, um, it's a beautiful setting up there. It's a great place to yeah. go to high school. Um, and so we're focusing our time and attention there, just sort of giving it a little bit of a facelift. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful up there. And then the K-8, um, which is over by the airport, uh, yeah. we are building a new K-4 through village. Okay. Um, and that will be, construction should be completed at the end of May, and then we'll spend the oh, summer doing landscaping and yeah. moving things in, and it will be ready on day one next school year. And Myri is an architect, and she helped design it. So not only is she a parent, she is she wears many hats for us, and is, is a really brilliant yeah, lady. So it's exciting. Um, it's it's it is it's super exciting. Uh, that is that's that's great that you can also be involved in literally the design and construction yeah. of your child's learning environment. And actually, the most important influence of the design was being a parent of an asset child and knowing from the inside how they teach and what they need to teach. But I actually, Ryan, the first time I met you, you you said gig, uh, wiggles, giggles or wig, wiggles. Get the wiggles out. Wiggles out. <laughs> and Ryan said we go outside a lot because our children tend to have a lot of wiggles, and we need to get the wiggles out. And I remembered that so many times when designing the new school mm, with with G70 is that you need to create an environment where a child has equal access to a living learning space outside as inside and i can see it and i can easily access it and it's it's seamless and that one statement you said actually was one of the biggest influencers cool and so it's made for a student who learns differently but to be honest, any student would ex yeah. would succeed in that. It sounds like just a really wonderful environment for any student to be in, and uh, and the types of classes that you offer, and, and the way that everything is. Yeah. If uh, I know you have fundraisers involved, so some students receive, uh, I'm guessing, tuition scholarships or partial scholarships or something along those lines. Yeah, we do our best. We know. I mean, as a private school, we know that tuition is hard for a lot of families, especially yeah. you know with a school like ours. Our, our mission is really unique and specific. Some parents may not have planned on being private school yeah. parents, but yeah. this is sort of what they figured out their child needs. So we do, we, you know, we, we, this past year, I think it was about $850,000 in financial wow. assistance, wow. which for a school our size is, size is, is good. Um, we're trying to always do more. We know that if we could give more to folks, um, more kids would come. Yep. We know that mm -hmm. that is a, a, you know, a burden for some families, so mm -hmm. we try our best. Well, people can uh, always donate to your school by going to assets hyphen school.net yes, uh, and you have uh, regular fundraisers throughout the year and uh, I know you have uh, a lot of uh, unique and interesting programs that we haven't gotten to you yet like your assets teacher training and outreach program where you're going to the wider community and I saw in the past you've offered classes to adults with dyslexia so 
a lot of topics that we won't be able to get to today, unfortunately, because we are out of time. And I really appreciate you both coming in here sincerely to, to tell us about your own personal experience and mm. experience with your kids and, and how meaningful this, this school is for you. And for you to be a, a, a principal at the school, how gratifying that must be to see the, the kids come in develop and grow and yeah. manage a staff of obviously really terrific and dedicated teachers. So uh, maybe I hope you'll come back again and maybe we can bring a student who has an experience next mm -hmm. time or a teacher or somebody sure. else. That'd be great. And that yeah. would, we, we would love that yeah. uh, because uh, if they want more information, they can go to assets-school.net. Yes. And um, in any event, that, I'm sorry that we are out of time, but thank you so much for being here. This is Winston Welch on Think Tech Live Out and About Streaming Network series. Today we have been speaking with Ryan Mesa and uh, Mari Kim of Asset School. Thanks for tuning in. We welcome your feedback. Thanks to our broadcast engineer, Ray Sengeling, our technical producer, Ian Davidson, our floor manager, Robert McLean, and to Jay Fidel, our executive producer, who puts it all together. I will see you here every other Monday or maybe once a month, depending on if David Tasaka is taking the show or not, at 3 p.m. for more of Out and About on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>